Hello and welcome to Nursing Emergencies. This is the first in a series of nursing emergencies. Hopefully we'll give you a little better feel for what you need to do when you're dealing with patients who are decompensating. This first part is cardiac. And our first problem we're going to take a look at here is acute coronary syndrome. My name is David Woodruff, and I hope to make this as easy for you as our Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy book. In order to be able to manage emergencies well, one of the first things that's necessary is to change the way that you're thinking. If you're working on a med surge floor and you are faced with an emergency situation, we need to switch gears and start thinking like an emergency department nurse. There's a few things that go into the way that an emergency department nurses think. One is preparation. So they have done some thought and preparation ahead of time so that they are ready for that emergency situation. There is practice that occurs. They practice maybe in a controlled setting like an ACLS class or maybe there's not as controlled a, an environment of practice where you're practicing IVs or practicing other things uh, on the side and in different types of environments at seminars, etc. And then there's the teamwork piece. Working together as a team, as a full medical team. I know we talk about teamwork a lot in nursing. Unfortunately, we're not quite there yet that we're really working as an intra-professional team where everybody has equal input and everybody has the same kind of drive toward getting that patient better and not just serving their own self-interest. We're getting there. Emergency departments seem to work much better as a team where everybody would just chip in wherever is necessary because you get into situations that are really very distressing. The first piece then again is preparedness. In order to be prepared for an emergency situation, there's a certain amount of education that is necessary. So taking those classes, the ACLS and the CPR classes, etc., so that you're prepared for that emergency situation to occur. Embrace diversity, and by this I mean diversity of your patient's presentation. Not all patients who have acute coronary syndrome, for example, are going to present with having chest pain. So that's embracing the diversity in the way that the patient is presenting. And then there is the practice piece. The part of preparedness is practicing. Some of that practice occurs in your mind. Going over what you've learned and thinking about how would I deal with that in this situation? How would I deal with that in this type of patient population? As Morton C. Blackwell said, in moments of crisis, the initiative passes to those who are best prepared. Practice. Prioritizing care is not innate. Nobody is born with the ability to be able to prioritize care. It's something that we learn by practicing. In order to be able to manage critically ill patients or patients who are having an acute crisis, it takes practice. Some ways to help you practice are by using cheat sheets or clinical tools. Okay, you may say, well, that's not practice, that's a, just a cheat sheet. The cheat sheet is going to remind you of the things that you need to do when those crisis situations occur. There are going to be crisis situations that come up where you maybe have to deal with them once a year or maybe once in your entire career. In those kind of situations, you're going to need to have a cheat sheet or a clinical tool or something like that to help you to remember what you're supposed to do and when. Another way to practice is by role playing. We do this all the time with ACLS, with CPR, Annie, Annie, are you okay? Teamwork. Sure, we have clearly defined roles and we have our professional relationships, but those roles blur when necessary. So when it comes down to it and we have stuff that needs to get done for this critically ill patient, those roles blur. And anybody who's available is going to be the one that's going to help. Embrace technology. 
and use technology to help with teamwork. So let's talk about our first emergency situation using some of these skills of thinking like an emergency department nurse. And the first one is talking about acute coronary syndrome. Acute coronary syndrome occurs when we have this atherosclerotic disease that is building up in the vessels around the heart. What the diagram in the bottom of the page is showing is it's showing the, the blood vessel there and the red blood cells moving along with it. And you can see that there is this yellowish kind of a plaque that is forming on the blood vessel. So over to the left side, we have a little bit of plaque forming, but there's still good blood flow. Then in the middle, we have quite a bit of plaque forming, but there's still some blood flow around it. And then we have complete obstruction of the vessel. So as we move through and we talk about these different problems, keep in mind that they are on a continuum just as how that plaque built up in that vessel is on a continuum. So we have this underlying atherosclerotic disease that leads to having angina when there's enough plaque around the walls of that vessel, that when that patient is active and doing things, that now there's not enough blood flow getting to the heart. It will lead to unstable angina, which might be our middle picture at the bottom there, where the plaque is very significant, but we still have some blood flow around it. In unstable angina, your patient is going to have angina. They're going to have chest pain at rest chest pain that is not relieved by having nitroglycerin or oxygen. Well, geez, that sounds an awful lot like a myocardial infarction, doesn't it? Because as you can see from those pictures, when we move from that center picture over to the picture on the right of these different blood vessels, there's not a whole lot of difference. There's some Blood flow still remaining in the middle picture and no blood flow in the one to the right, but there's not a lot of difference between those two. So we can kind of blur the lines here a little bit once we hit unstable angina. From there, we move into a non-ST segment elevation MI. And so we have a myocardial infarction that's occurred without having EKG changes. And then we move over to the ST segment elevation MI. So the most severe form where we have so much damage occurring to the heart that we also have changes in our EKG. So how would we prevent the patient from developing a uh, acute coronary syndrome? Now, obviously, there's a lot of things that we do for our outpatient to try to prevent them from having an acute coronary syndrome, watching the diet, managing the lipids, all those kind of things are all involved in the process. However, when we have a patient who's in the hospital who has a history of atherosclerotic disease, maybe has a history of unstable angina, or maybe had a previous MI, how are we going to prevent that patient from having an acute coronary syndrome? That's where we need to be thinking about maintaining our cardiac oxygenation. In other words, plugging in the pump. We need to plug in that pump so that it's going to work effectively and get enough oxygen to the heart. We do that by maintaining the oxygen level in the blood. And so, and there's really no benefit to giving patients additional oxygen if their oxygen saturation is already okay. But there are other things we can do too. And in order to plug in the pump, we need to get that oxygenated blood to the myocardium. Well, we can have all the oxygen we want in that blood, but if that blood does not get to the myocardium because we have narrowed vessels, then we're still not going to be meeting the need. So we may have to give some vasodilators in order to plug in the pump. Anticipate cardiac dysfunction in our patients who have atherosclerotic disease. Presentation, as most of us know, is going to be chest pain. So we normally associate chest pain with acute coronary syndrome, but we can also have respiratory distress. And in fact, many of our patients who are in the hospital who are either being medicated for pain and or maybe have some kind of neurologic changes occurring may not be able to tell you about chest pain. So instead, we may have to look for respiratory distress being our primary presenting symptom of an acute coronary syndrome. Uh, one thing to keep in mind if your patient's presenting symptom 
is respiratory distress, those patients tend to have a worse outcome. And here's why. It's because chest pain is the first symptom that most patients get. If our patient did not get chest pain for one reason or another, one reason could be that just they've had this long-standing atherosclerotic disease, so it's not something that's really sudden. They're not having any chest pain with it. But, or maybe the patient has a change in level of consciousness or is being treated for pain. At any rate, the patient is presenting now with respiratory distress instead of presenting with chest pain. Those patients typically are a little bit further down the line in other words, their disease has progressed further down the line before they start developing their respiratory distress. And that's a bad sign because that means that that patient probably could have a worse outcome. Nausea and vomiting and diaphoresis. So these are the big ones we want to be looking for to look for an acute coronary syndrome. EKG changes. Oh, yeah, we always talk about EKG changes as being part of, part and parcel of our <laughs> patients who have an acute coronary syndrome. We can see ST segment depression or T wave inversion. ST segment depression, T wave inversion indicates ischemia. Okay, so that's our patient having angina. ST segment elevation, that's what this EKG is showing here. We have a lead two showing uh, ST segment elevation. You can see the QRS complex goes right into the T wave and that T wave is way above our baseline. ST segment elevation indicates injury. And then finally, we can have Q waves. Notice that this EKG also has Q waves. Q waves are the initial downward deflection. The initial downward deflection. Now, these Q waves really are not very significant. We'd like to see them be about one-third the height of the R wave. And in this case, it's, I don't know, maybe about a sixth of the height of the R wave. So that's not a really huge Q wave. But Q waves indicate necrosis. So with Q waves, the damage is done. There's nothing you can do about it. When it's necrotic, it's necrotic. In a necrotic tissue, we debride. We don't try to save necrotic tissue. Where we're trying to save is we're trying to save these areas that are ischemic and injured. And oftentimes those areas will radiate out from the necrosis, kind of like a target does. And so we want to try to save those areas around the area that's necrotic. So even if we have Q waves, we can also say, well, forget it, you know, damage is done. Well, there's areas around that necrosis that are just injured or ischemic, and those are the areas we're trying to save. So our prompt action is going to be to increase our oxygen delivery. A number of ways we can do that. One way is to increase our diastolic filling time. If the patient's heart rate is very fast and they're just tacking along like crazy, they don't have enough time to fill those coronary arteries and get enough oxygen to the heart muscle. So we want to slow that heart down. Maybe we can slow the heart down by trying to get the patient to relax. You know, talking with the patient, etc. Uh, maybe the patient needs something for anxiety in order to get them to relax. But we want to slow that heart down any way we can. Coronary vasodilation is another possibility. So we give the nitro to open up those vessels, get more oxygen to the heart. We may give supplemental oxygen. Again, the recommendations are that we're going to give supplemental oxygen if our patient's O2 saturation is low. Otherwise, if it's normal, then we're just going to uh, move past that. There's no benefit to giving additional oxygen. And in fact, if we give additional oxygen, and again, this is oxygen the patient doesn't need. You know, a patient's got an oxygen saturation of 97%. They don't need any additional oxygen. Okay, they've got fully saturated blood, right? All right, so we give them extra oxygen. What happens is that extra oxygen goes to those areas that are being injured and turns into oxygen-free radicals and causes more injury to the myocardium. Revascularization may be a priority here, so we may have to go in with a cath and open up that vessel so that we can get blood flow to that area of the heart. Secondly, we want to decrease oxygen consumption. There are two things that are going to increase oxygen consumption. Now, many of you may have heard of this in a different manner. When uh, most of us learned about hemodynamics, we learned that cardiac output equals heart rate times stroke volume. Okay, well, if the cardiac output, which is what the heart is doing, is it's pumping blood out, if that's dependent upon heart rate and stroke volume, the same two things are going to be responsible for oxygen consumption. The faster the heart beats, 
the more oxygen it uses. The more we stretch it, the more powerful a contraction we get. And maybe you remember that back from, you know, pathophysiology and you remember hearing about Starling's law of the heart. The more you stretch it, the harder it contracts. Well, that's going to use more oxygen. So we don't want it to stretch a whole lot. Well, what's stretching the heart? Blood coming back to the heart, preload. So we want to get that fluid volume away from the heart so we're not overwhelming the heart and overstretching it. Those two things then are going to decrease our oxygen consumption. Now, even if we have decreased oxygen delivery, hopefully we will balance this equation if our oxygen consumption decreases. Well, thank you for joining me for the first in our series here of nursing emergencies. This was cardiac and acute coronary syndrome. Let's move on to the rest of the nursing emergencies program so that we can explore more ways to manage emergencies in your patients. Thanks for joining me. Until next time, bye now.